Okay, so we're in chapter 4 of Romans, obviously, again. Um, we're going to go over just a few verses today, verses 9 through 12. So flip to Romans, you guys. <clears throat> um, so we're going to read this, and then we're going to jump back to Genesis um, 17. So just be prepared for that. Um, actually, I'll start at the beginning and go to 12. Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that was not God's way. For the scripture tells us, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Now, is this blessing only for the Jews, or is it also for uncircumcised Gentiles? Well, we have been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous by God because of his faith. But how did this happen? Was he counted as righteous only after he was circumcised, or was it before he was circumcised? Clearly, God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised. Circumcision was a sign that Abraham had already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous, even before he was circumcised. So Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised. They are counted as righteous because of their faith. And Abraham is also the spiritual father of those who have been circumcised, but only if they have the same kind of faith Abraham had before he was circumcised. Flip back to Genesis. 17, as I said. Uh, verse 9. <clears throat> God said to Abraham, Your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. You and all your... Actually, let's go back to the beginning of 17. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. At this, Abraham fell face down on the ground. Then God said to him, This is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham. For you will be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations, and kings will be among them. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And I will give the entire land of Canaan, where you now live, as a foreigner, to you and your descendants. It will be their possession forever, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, Your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. You and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. This is the covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. You must cut off the flesh of your foreskin as a sign of the covenant between me and you. From generation to generation, every male child must be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. This applies not only to members of your family, but also to the servants born in your household and the foreign-born servants whom you have purchased. All must be circumcised. Your bodies will bear the mark of my everlasting covenant. Any male who fails to be circumcised will be cut off from the covenant family. <clears throat> so, unlike Josh's former Bible study, I hope you are all not uncomfortable talking about circumcision. Otherwise, you can leave. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um... <laughs> um so what we have here is Paul addressing the Jews, and you know there's an implication that, more than an implication, the Jews were caught up in the law, as they like to do. Um, and they even were retconning history, sort of. Um, they believed that circumcision was the way to be made right with God, because that's what our father Abraham did. Um, 
the, the, from the time that God first spoke to Abram, Abram at the time, um, to when he made this, made this covenant with Abraham and changed his name, there's a gap of like 13 to 15 years. And apparently the Jews forget this, forgot this. I feel weird because I can't see you because of this. <laughs> I just see the top of your head. Whatever. Um, uh, yeah, they, they are not remembering correctly their, their roots and what happened with their father Abraham. Um, and they're, they're caught up in the law. And not only are they caught up in the law, they're sort of snobs about it and entitled. Um, yeah, they believed, they believed that this, this outward act of circumcision was all that they needed to do in order to be made right with God. Paul addresses that clearly here that, and points even to the beginning of Abraham's relationship with God that it's not, it is not anything that he has done or will do. It's merely the faith that he shows. And he's saying that to these Jews. It's, this, is not, this is not, again, what made Abraham right with God. <laughs> um, but his faith. And, and he makes sort of a, a yeah, a controversial statement to the Jews um, by saying that Abraham is the father of, of all who have faith like him, and, and th- those people are made right with God. Um, Jews are sort of, the Jews were sort of snobs about this. They didn't believe that any, anybody outside of this physical ancestry of Abraham was, you know, worthy of, of God's relationship. Um, Paul says the opposite. He says that anybody that has faith like Abraham is grafted. Romans 11, I believe it's Romans 11, says that by faith we are grafted into a relationship with God. And anyone that does not have that faith, those branches are you know, chopped off until they regain that, until they regain that faith in the Lord. Um, And he says that this, this act of circumcision isn't, isn't um, the, the like, end all to being made right with God. And that's, I mean, that's similar to, to um, things that you see today. People, people want to take things and replace them or, you know, make them a gateway so to speak, of what it, what it takes to become in a relationship with God. And they'll try to tell you that this is this and this and this is how you, you get to a right relationship with God, you know, whether it's good works, which Paul is addressing here, whether it's, you know, love and love is all you need, whether it's, you know, you don't go to church every Sunday and so there's no way that you, you, can, be, you can be in good standing with God. Um, that's kind of too small thinking. Um, Paul says that, again, he stresses in this whole chapter, and even before this chapter, in chapter 3, 2, and pretty much throughout all of Romans, um, he hits this concept of faith pretty hard that um, it's not anything else that we can do or will do, but faith is what makes us right with God. Um, Now, we don't just stop there, you know, just like the Jews don't just stop at circumcision, and then they think that they're good. Um, when we have faith, we, you know, we carry that on and do, you know, all of these other things. Um, but Paul, Paul's addressing the Jews, which wanted to stop wrongly at the, this, this point of circumcision, that this is all that they needed in order to mirror with God, and we're the physical descendants of Abraham, and so we, by nature, inherit... Uh, you know, good standing with the Lord. Um, and that's important to know for us. Um, you know, just because we are Christians and we, you know, sincerely believe in the Lord and, and you know, trust him and, you know, he's the pen, he is the focal point of our lives, it doesn't mean that Oliver is going to be that. It doesn't mean that, you know, any of our kids are going to be that. 
we have a responsibility to, the, to our kids to, um, you know, raise them and discipline them and allow them every opportunity in knowing the Lord. But at some point, they will have to make, I mean, you know, a few weeks ago, they will have to make a declaration of their own, um, of, of faith. And, you know, and Paul says that it's, it's by that faith that we are grafted in. It's not anything that we can, you know, outwardly do or show. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's interesting how things are taken um, in today's society. Things are just sort of taken out of context and forgotten about. Uh, I had a back before Oliver was even born. I had a conversation with a coworker about um, circumcision, and he was saying that he doesn't believe in it. And and then he like gave me some weird fake origin story of circumcision that I thought was interesting. And um, yeah, I think it's interesting how things are taken out of context and they become um, social norms and become flippant things, um, like circumcision. Uh, It's sort of becoming more controversial and less popular in America nowadays, but um, circumcision was a sign of of Abraham's faith. It wasn't what he did to get that credit from God. You know, the word, the Greek word, logozomai, or I mentioned it last week. Probably a wrong pronunciation, but that wasn't what Abraham did in order to receive that credit on Abraham's life. Um, But, you know, yeah, where was I? Taken out of context. Yeah. Um, when we were when we were deciding um, and talking about it about Oliver, you know, it wasn't much of a discussion. I mean, because Brittany because Brittany and I were on the same page, but um, we wanted to do that with the proper context, not because it was um, you know a, a, a social norm. You know, you circumcise your boy or you know whatever, but. We did it with the, the intent that we want to do that because it's a sign of, of our faith. It's not, yeah, it's a sign of our faith in God. And uh, that was a really intense experience for those of you who have experienced that and were a part of it. Um, yeah, it was one of the, it was sort of a watershed moment in my life, if you will, but because Brittany and I were, yeah, we were, we were like, you know, restraining him. Um, and it's really intense, and to watch it, and to be a part of it, and it can be um, really sad if you take it just on its own, you know? Um, you're, you know, you're like hurting your baby, and that's like the last thing you want. But I remember like, in the middle of it, as I'm getting, like, lightheaded, which I don't get lightheaded over things like this. Um, I'm pretty good, actually. Like, blood doesn't bother me, but, like, almost I got caught up in, in, like, just the act and just the moment and not what it was intended to mean and what I wanted it to mean, but I had to, like, take a moment, like, a split second to, like, you know, talk to God and, like, you know, dedicate this moment and this sign to God. Um, Yeah, the the sign of our intent for Oliver to be raised up that way. Um, Just a small thing, and we did it, you know, when we, and we did it again up here. You know, we did a dedication, but, um, yeah, that is not where it stops for Oliver at some point in his um, life, hopefully early. I mean, we saw how beautiful it was with Sophia, but at some point in Oliver's life, he'll have to decide, you know, and then he can start, you know, outwardly showing signs of his faith, too, with God, but yeah, it was a really crazy moment um, in 
my life and his life and Brittany's life. But yeah, things are taken out of context. And so we wanted to, when we were doing it, I wanted to, and I know Brittany wanted to, like make sure that the full intent, just like with Abraham and God's covenant to Abraham saying, do this as a sign, um, we wanted that to be fully a part of it. Um, so yeah. Excuse me. So I want to ask you guys some questions. <clears throat> Abraham's legacy was wide-reaching for Jew and to Gentile. And I want you guys to think about, obviously, maybe not, I don't know, who knows. Um, your legacy, it will be different than Abraham's. We know that his affected mankind for the rest of, you know, whatever, as a sign of, of faith. He was an example for the rest of history. Um, what will your legacy be like, um, and how will it, how far will it reach people? Um, how do you outwardly show your faith and belief in God, or do you hide and shy away? Does your faith and belief in God um, bring others to Him, like Abraham's faith? How do people try and convince you to measure your faith? Um, And I thought I had one more. That's it. Those four questions, uh, we can type them on the board if you need them, but please discuss these things.